Um, actually, what, what happened was um, I got to these images coming out of my art base installation where I was interested in returning to a way of working that I could control from start to finish and not have to turn over to fabricators or foray into um, ways of, of making things that I wasn't adept at. And so I, um, like the butterflies, I started fooling around with the ink plots, which are also a somewhat common image, but um, an image pretty much without a, a purpose. And and these are ink blots you made yourself. I made myself right on bond, just bond paper, um, playing around with manipulating the material and creating these kind of accidental, what I call liquid events, um, with them. But when I first started working with the imagery and adding color, I had literally had drafting film and was playing around with colored pencils as a way of just making a study for what I thought were going to be paintings. And as it happened, it took me about ten years to get to making paintings out of the images because I was. Mm. Um, what I, the, why drafting film is because it's this heavy plastic material and it, um, one of its important qualities for me is that it's translucent, that I draw on both sides. So it allowed me, even when I first did it, I was only working on one-sided film, but when I discovered I could work on both sides, that doubling of the image, um, again, excessive work, excessive reproduction, doing more than one has to, but it cancels out the marks that the pencil makes. Mm. So you can't quite tell how the images are constructed, and then in, it also serves as an underpainting so that the color on the back of the drawing influences the color on the front, so I can create more color than otherwise you would be available. Denser. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, I like that plastic as a material. It's a heavier, it, it, it makes you think about the material that it's on rather than take it for granted like you would paper. And I think if I, you know, if I, had my way, I would have them on frame, but it's not practical in this kind of context. And what is Fabcom? Um, this is the the only place that my work connects to the Rorschach. <laughs> the only place, um, which is that the term Fabcom is an abbreviation for fabulized combination, which is one of the categories of scoring on the Rorschach personality test inventory. Okay. And I just liked the <clears throat> the nonsensical kind of sound of it, or the the. Fab just means fabulous or fabulized or whatever. So, and then um, you took this idea back into mm -hmm. felt sculptural. We saw the origins in the now or never right. piece, exactly. and um, I liked the material. The material in that previous piece was just synthetic craft felt, which I didn't like, and this is uh, all primarily wool felt. Um, I was have always been involved in my work in working with materials that we've extracted from or exploited from animals. So the wool was important. Um, the color is essentially found, it's color that... So the felt comes in. The felt comes in. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just interested in animating the form, making it physical. Um, because again, it's a somewhat nonsensical form. There's no logical explanation for why that particular con uh, contour is in the world. Um, one of the things I really like about working with the ink blots, two things. One is that they're infinitely original, like none is ever like another. Mm -hmm. And also because I combine them in my work, so their combinations will always be infinitely different. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also like the fact that they are, they're essentially a found image, but they're a found image that doesn't have another correlative model in the mm -hmm. actual world. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I've always been more comfortable with Yeah, here's one images. that's less symmetrical. Uh, Yep. <laughs> Where did it come from? <laughs> it came from being less symmetrical. It's just something that I've been that I explore from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm I return to the symmet symmetrical ones. I'm more more involved with those. But I was um, it, I think when you when I was divorcing the pieces from the symmetrical image that and these are these are grafted from the same material. There's I mean the same source material. So they are more irrational, more nonsensical, because you can't figure out how the shapes came into being at all. Mm -hmm. I think in the symmetrical ones, you can kind of guess how they came into existence. And this is in the show, Orange Alert <laughs> Afterglow. And this is one of the first paintings of this series, correct? Yes, yeah. So, to, was it, 2008, 2008. Second and, painting in the series, I think. Yeah, the, the turquoise one was first, but mm -hmm. these, are early, these are, as I said, the first paintings I've done since... And um, where does the color come from? Time. How did you get those colors? <laughs> why, you mean why did I choose to use those colors? Or did I, I, well, I made the color by mixing paint. Right, right, right. But that's not what you're asking. Yeah, I mean, how <laughs> um, did you get to those? 
what those I, color combinations what I, well, or those particular colors. Where throughout this work, I've been talking about about making things that don't seem like I made them, or using materials that pre-existed or images that pre-existed. And my aim, which I don't think I'm totally successful at yet, but my aim is to to create a sense a sense and sensation of color that is irrational in the sense that it's driven by something outside of my artistic taste or aesthetic taste. So, um, and that's true in all of the drawings, all of the drawings that I started with the ink blots that um, color driven by gen uh, genetic coding, like mm -hmm. butterfly wings, or right. color that might come from um, irrational states or unconscious states, things that you don't consciously put yourself to test to perceive. And um, in this particular case, as with the other painting and the last drawing, which I guess we'll see, the they all started as uh, colored pencil drawings like the one you showed earlier right. that have been manipulated digitally in, in Photoshop so that the uh, scanner and the computer sees the color in the drawing as a completely different arrangement of color because it sees it in RGB color and when you start playing with it and asking it to change say reds or change magentas or change cyans it finds those colors in places you didn't know that they were so the color is outside of what I would have been able to imagine right so it came from outside of my imagination through the computer and then I think this is the last image mm -hmm. uh, chroma ray what is chroma ray it's just the name I use for the the color that I'm splitting out on the computer now in the drawings. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I haven't done very many uh, pieces that way yet, and I haven't done, I've done more, not more paintings, but I've done as many paintings really as drawings that's pretty new. So this is one of the first large scale series drawings that I've used that same procedure with. And it's drawn on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same thing. Very labor intensive. Very labor intensive. Well, pretty much, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, and what's next? Um, more of the same. I'm, of the I'm, same. I'm making a painting this summer. That's as you know. right, you are. <laughs> and good luck with that. Yeah. Thank you, Constance Love. Okay. And finally, our next artist is Alex Rubio, a San Antonio native. Alex has been a mural coordinator at San Anto Cultural Arts and art instructor at several schools and institutions around San Antonio, including Blue Star Contemporary Art Center, the University of Texas at San Antonio, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, and the Bayer County Detention Center. He has had a solo exhibition at Blue Star uh, Contemporary Arts Center uh, San, in San Antonio. His work is included in the Distinguished Cheech Marine Collection of Latino Art, and he has been a recipient of a major grant from the Joan Mitchell Foundation. Welcome, Alex Rubio. Thank you. Okay, well, a as we mentioned, Alex, you, you started out as a muralist. Yes. <clears throat> um, Actually, I was trained at uh, uh, several of these organizations that I eventually started working with, uh, um, uh, the Community Cultural Arts Organization. Uh, in the uh, Cassiano Homes Housing Project, I was about 16 when I was recruited uh, from the Mirasol Housing Project that I grew up in 18 years. Mm. I uh, eventually uh, moved on to uh, uh, the jail arts program at the Bear County Detention Center, and I served as a uh, instructor and a mural instructor, and I had a core group of uh, um, general population uh, mural <laughs> students, mural yes. inmate students, yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, continued to do uh, public works in the community uh, with San Anto Cultural Arts, uh, Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. So large-scale works uh, uh, was um, uh, very important to me at that time. I was trained as, as a large-scale painter, but also, I think, as a community uh, arts uh, organizer. And, and tell us about this mural here. Uh, this is the Virgen de Guadalupe. Uh, uh, this was a commission at the San Fernando Cathedral by Father Virgilio Elizondo back in 1989. And I always credit this piece as being the, uh, the, the piece where I actually discovered uh, quite a bit about myself. I think uh, this is the first piece where I actually started using the texture that I apply to my canvas now. And, and, and I have been ever since 1989. Uh, I think out of frustration, I was painting very 
uh, traditionally blended modeled uh, layers of paint one day on the scaffolding and uh, I remember this day because uh, I'm, I'm always telling this story uh, with Vincent and, and reminding uh, myself when, when this happened. It was very spiritual almost. I started hatching away at this canvas and these lines just appeared, uh, this line texture. And I felt very comfortable. I, I, I felt like, you know, this is the way uh, I should be painting, you know? So I just uh, clicked on that, copied it, and dragged it across the whole canvas almost, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I've been painting that way ever since. And uh, Vincent Valdez was uh, one of my young assistants and uh, uh, a young student. Uh, at that time, he was 11. He was about yeah. 11 years old. <laughs> and how old were you? Oh, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> I know he you was 11. You weren't that old either at that time. <laughs> Okay, speaking of, of Vincent. Right. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the early works, uh, I, I really love lecture, uh, whenever, whenever I do present work, I, I always bring up these uh, community pieces because I think uh, that's, you know, what got my career uh, started in, in that early time. And this piece has been following us all weekend, and it, it has for the past 16 years. But uh, uh, just this weekend, we uh, found out that uh, the piece had been painted over, and, and uh, being a Southside, um, you know, iconic uh, uh, mural works or public piece, uh, the community uh, came out in protest uh, and uh, very disappointed, very passionate uh, pleas for, uh, um, you know, a reason why these these works, uh, this works no longer exists. So the good news is. Uh, that we just came from a meeting from uh, Burbank High School, Vincent Valdez and I, and uh, uh, we had a very positive meeting with the uh, SAISD uh, administration and, and board members, and uh, <clears throat> they did uh, feel very, uh, um, um, I guess, uh, they felt for the community, and they did apologize for, uh, as they said there in, in insensitive uh, decision uh, uh, of removing the piece. And they have now, uh, I guess because of this, this uh, event, uh, they are putting forth a directive where all SAISD murals in, uh, in, in San Antonio will be cataloged. And uh, they will put forth a, a, a program where artists uh, will receive uh, a form of stipend, and they will pay for materials and supplies, and uh, and ask the artists to come back and restore and renovate these old murals, and and not only at Burbank, but this is all SAISD, and uh, have rededications of these murals. You know, so, so it's very tragic that we've lost this mural, but it, but the silver lining is that some good is going to come. Very good has come of it, and uh, the great news is that uh, Vincent Valdez is. Uh, works inside the cafeteria will be preserved in that way as well. And uh, um, I'm, I was very happy about that because I also have uh, other murals within SAISD yes. and now uh, I feel a lot more confident that you know these, these works will be uh, preserved and protected for the students. Moving into the mid 1990s, you you made a, a major leap from doing just murals to painting on canvas and paper with a very powerful psychedelic vocabulary of sensibility and images such as this one. And I know there's a personal story here, so why don't you tell it? Uh, actually, most of the early works are based on true life experiences, real life people and places, environments in my life, uh, a lot of them being very harsh and, and hard to look at sometimes. But uh, I like to say, I like to use the word uh, true story. Uh, this is a true story when uh, I, I remind myself of this, these, these incidents on the streets of San Antonio and, and in my West Side uh, neighborhoods. Uh, this street preacher was this preacher um, standing outside uh, uh, on Commerce Street near the uh, San Fernando Cathedral. And he was preaching about his life and, you know, confessing uh, to everyone that could hear him uh, all the, you know, in his words, evil things that he has done. But it's okay now. He's found salvation. And uh, he was right up in my face and 
screaming and 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 you know telling people that hey you, you guys are going to hell you know so uh i i found that a very pos powerful image and i just had to go home and and sketch this uh, this preacher out uh and that's what usually i do i have these memories in my mind and you know when i get to the studio or get back home i just start sketching these out i i rarely use the photo references for these characters uh but they are based on 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 real life experiences this is Jesus y Chavalón. Um, I grew up uh, right down the street um, from all my friends uh, that lived around the housing projects in the Mirasol courts. And uh, at that time, every night on television, there was uh, something about gang activity in the west side, you know, drive-bys in the west side. So uh, this was a friend of mine, one of my neighbors that lived in the little neighborhood around the courts. And he had uh, several small young children. He was very young himself. But uh, he was already dressing his, his children up in these gang colors. So uh, he knew I was an artist. Uh, uh, he had seen the murals in the courts. And uh, I did a series of tattoos, you know, the uh, uh, friends of mine that I would do homemade tattoos on. And he goes, hey, you should paint my portrait. And he opened up his shirt, and he had his, his gun tucked into his pants. So I never forgot that. And uh, his name was Jesus, Jesse. And uh, Chavalon means uh, his baby, Chavalon or, or child. Did he, did he see the portrait? When you yeah, I, usually uh, I, I go back, I show these guys sketches, uh, 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 and, and you know, I always invite these guys what to my shows. What did he, he loved it, he loved it. He, you know, I, I think uh, uh, at that point, um, um, they're very proud of their lifestyles, and uh, to me it's very uh, uh, disturbing that, you know, uh, um, these, these images and icons are closer than they appear. You know, they're not just in the West Side neighborhoods, they're in all communities, you know, where drug violence, domestic violence, and gang violence happens. The early drawings, uh, they're very brightly lit, I think, because I used to use a lot of neon uh, colors, which is uh, uh, neon gouache. Uh, and uh, actually they, they came out with uh, neon color pencils not too long ago. So uh, the early mixed media drawings were very, very warm. So I wanted to take that into uh, printmaking. I've done several prints through uh, San Coronado's workshop in Austin. I did uh, uh, some prints up in uh, Self-Help Graphics uh, 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 and in LA. And this one was from Sam Coronado, so I, I asked Sam, hey, do you have any neon silkscreen ink? And he, and he special ordered some uh, shades of red neon ink, and uh, this piece is uh, titled El Diablito. And uh, uh, these are just those crazy vices that, you know, they say the, the Diablito, the little devil, is, is always, you know, influencing us. And um, uh, since then, uh, I've continued to use neon paints in my work, even even to this day in my current paintings. And w what's the image? The image is a little a devil, a little diablito, and you see little icons on his cap and, and uh, uh, that refer to drug, uh, the drug culture, uh, gang, uh, gang culture, uh, I guess all those underground, you know, uh, uh, culture that, that people consider evil, you know? So uh, I, I titled him El Diablito. And Burland. Burland. Uh, this is actually a true story. You know, I think uh, one day I was at Burland, and I do a lot of research in bars. You know, I I, I uh, draw there quite a bit, so it's my studio sometimes. But this is this really happened. These guys, uh, and you have to read into the the piece. And I use a lot of slang. Uh, uh, words in these pieces. For example, uh, um, the the, burri, the burro, the male is El Sancho, and uh, the the other female burra, burra is uh, La Sancha, which is their lovers. They are, uh, um, but they're also married. You know, so uh, one night at Burland, you know, the Sancho and the Sancha were there uh, drinking together, and uh, the wife came through the back door, and if. Burland still exists. If you guys get a chance to go out there, uh, it used to be a great, um, you know, watering hole, ice house, dive in the in the west side, and uh, um, uh, I think that's what I tried to do is is you know find these really colorful uh, cultural images and and you know sometimes you know uh, it takes a, a while for me to 
to put these ideas down on paper, to translate my memories down on paper. And, and, and why are they portrayed all as donkeys and burros? Because of Burland. Every If you go into the bar, everything is, is little donkey uh, statues and <laughs> photographs and, you know, all kinds of little uh, burro uh, images. It's a little fuzzy. La Bacha and El Gusano. It's a little fuzzy, but this is uh, La Bacha y El Gusano. Uh, it's a diptych, and uh, the Bacha is also slang for cigarette butt, and uh, El Gusano is the worm. Uh, so this is uh, continuing to, I guess, depict uh, different vices uh, in, in my life. I, I, I smoke a lot of uh, cigarettes and uh, drink a lot of uh, coffee. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think, uh, um, you know, I, I'm playing with these images. I'm really having fun, you know, at the same time. Uh, El, El Gusano is, you can see him floating around in the little bottle of, of uh, tequila. And what is El Gusano? El Gusano it means the worm, and that's a that's tequila a uh, with a worm in it. Okay. Though the early works, uh, I think we're really starting... Um, because of these experiences and, and you know, uh, real, real environments and real events in my life. Soon, as of 2001, or actually 2000, I started kind of looking outside of that and kind of looking into, uh, um, you know, these uh, almost spiritual connections that I have with works. And this is entitled La Lechuza, which means uh, basically the owl or in this case, the Owl Woman. And this is a piece that's in the Chicano Visions collection. Uh, Cheech Marin uh, uh, purchased this piece. It traveled the United States for about eight years. It went to the Smithsonian and caused a lot of, uh, of uh, drama. Uh, but uh, um, I'm, this is one of my favorite pieces because this piece is based on you know, growing up in a Chicano, Latino, Mexicano, Americano, Mexican American community and family that uh, these, these, uh, these folk tales and these, these stories are passed down to us. And in this case, the story of the Lechuza is she has, uh, it's an owl, a large owl, or an owl with the head of a female figure or the torso of a female figure. So all these stories that I grew up with, I combined into this one image. And actually this image, you know, causes nightmares uh, to a lot of people. It's really strange. And ever since I traveled with this piece, uh, people were coming up and telling me their own lechuza sightings, you know? So it's, it's not only here. It's, it's a lot it up north. Around. Yeah, it's, it's really strange. This is uh, the Four Horsemen. Uh, it's, uh, the whole piece is about eight foot high by eight foot across. And they're a total of... Uh, eight uh, canvas panels. And this piece was uh, exhibited at the McNay Museum of Art in the Oppenheimer Collection uh, room. And the, 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 the fun part was that uh, uh, Philip Luna, a local composer, wrote a four-piece movement to this painting. And it was playing in the background uh, during the opening. And it was a record night. We really kind of freaked out the guards there at the McNay. There were so many people there. Uh, and it was wonderful to, to hear the music uh, while people were walking through the gallery and seeing this work. Uh, it's based, uh, literally translated uh, from the Book of Revelations, uh, which are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And each panel contains traditional symbols, but it also refers to very uh, contemporary uh, world events. For example, during this time there was the bird flu. So the above the uh, the headpiece, uh, you see these the bird motif, and it starts off with uh, the bird flu piece, which is uh, the pestilence. Then it moves to the famine, which is represented by a, a vulture, and then the war, which is the eagle. And at the end, it's just the skeletal st uh, uh, image of a, of a bird, uh, and. Um, uh, this piece will soon be turned into uh, uh, stained glass on um, uh, light panels and hand-carved wood around the frames. So where that's you, coming soon. That? Uh, I'm working with uh, Kathy Armstrong mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sorry, Kathy Cunningham. She's mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we're really going to get this piece going, and I'm really excited about that. That is exciting. And then these two? These two pieces, this is entitled Trust. Uh, 
And uh, uh, um, this is a series that started back in 2004, 2005. And every other year, I've, I seem to just keep doing uh, uh, different uh, corazón pieces or heart pieces. And the first one was uh, the heart on the, the I guess, the uh, right, your right hand side. And uh, like I said, I started uh, you know, moving away and looking uh, more in, into uh, more spiritual uh, uh, tell, imagery. Tell us about the, the eye. The eye right. is the sort of consistent image. And I, I was, I'm, I'm almost kind of dissecting the human heart. And in this case, uh, in the uh, one piece, which is on your right hand side, that was more of an image of a heart infested with greed. So all the little icons and uh, images around that heart uh, is is derived from the dollar bill itself, you know. So, so the, the eye, the, the, the eye, bill. and the dollar bill is is that uh, that uh, uh, that's all that heart can see is is just and, that and greed. And why the dollar bill as an image for you? I think uh, I've been looking at more current events, uh, political events, uh, 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 you know, uh, politics and war uh, during uh, after after 9/11 for sure. Uh, and uh, uh, it's all based on this this uh, society and based on money and and politics. So the trust piece is also derived from the dollar bill, and I use the words that are on our dollar bill. And the dollar bill to me is a is um, is a talisman. Everyone has it in their pockets, you know. So uh, I I uh, did the second piece in 2005 um, as continuing that series of, of the Corazon or the Heart series. The La Cherry and Pura Raspa, the, this is a triptych and I love having fun with the, narr the narrative. So and in this piece you see uh, um, you know, these bees attacking these raspas. So it's almost like the war of the raspas or la batalla de las raspas. Uh, uh, and this, the raspa cart is, and raspa is snow cone. Uh, my neighbor sells uh, snow cones and he welded this corrugated metal roof on his snow cone cart. And he goes, yeah, I couldn't get my, you know, I, I, it was hard for me to get my, my permit because I, I modified my cart. And I go, man, that's pretty cool. You know, what would my raspa cart look like if I modified one or made one? <laughs> so this, this, uh, uh, this piece here is uh, composed of lowrider bike parts. I grew up in the west side. I would constantly go to, you know, the lowrider festivals in Camargo Park. And uh, uh, in the narrative, the, the um, raspa juice bottles become very animated, very human-like. So they're battling off these bees. On the left-hand panel, you see La Cherry, uh, which just finished you know, smashing one of the little bees as the rest of them kind of sneak up behind her. In the right-hand panel, it's almost like the spoils of war, or uh, 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 you see a little bee you know, gorged in, in you know, this syrup that this cone fell off the cart during this battle. So um, I, I, I remember a lot of uh, you know, caricatures and, and you know, underground comics, and uh, you know, like, uh, I, would, I grew up look, uh, looking at these posters, uh, Fabulous for Freak Brothers and stuff like that, because I'd go to Flipside all the time, and they always had these really crazy books and, and, and posters and Dayglow posters. So I think uh, I really uh, kind of felt close to the caricature and, and kind of exaggeration and elongation. Uh, this is the carreton, El Carreton, which is a cart or the shopping cart. This was an art pace residency uh, uh, installation. And um, the shopping cart is made out of uh, aluminum conduit that I worked with Luis uh, uh, Chispas. Uh, uh, I showed him my original drawing, and we worked together on, on you know, doing this sculptural piece. And I work with seven other artists in this piece. Uh, Shek Vega, which is who's a graffiti artist, and uh, again with uh, Phil Luna, who composed the music background. Uh, Adriana Garcia and, and uh, uh, Miguel, um, who uh, edited and filmed uh, the film that is actually being played on the facade of this fake tire shop. The whole idea came from, um, I, and of course, Kathy's uh, neon piece that you see uh, on behind the shopping cart, which is really, really cool. Uh, and Sheck had never worked around neon. He really loved doing that with Kathy's. But um, I think um, 
um, the piece uh, was trying to uh, definitely remind myself of this story where, you know, growing up, I would go into the, my favorite time was going to the HEB with my mom and coming back home, you know, to, uh, with a shopping cart full of groceries. And we'd leave the shopping cart by the side of the dumpster and a man would pick it up take it back and resell it to H-E-B, so he's making a little bit of money, you know. And, and you know, people, that was sometimes that was our only form of transportation. Uh, but soon H-E-B locked the wheels on this shopping cart, so you can't take them off the lot anymore. They got a magnetic wheel. So I was like, okay, this is an homage to, you know, uh, those, those old school stores, uh, uh, the little tienditas or family mom and pop stores that closed down because of HEBs and Walmarts. You know, soon we won't see tire shops anymore. And, and the, the cart relates to the tire shop in that way. You know, mm -hmm. now uh, uh, these family owned businesses are disappearing. So mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of uh, uh, pay homage to them, the families. This is uh, Abaddon, King of the Locusts. Now, again, going into uh, literary translation from the Book of Revelations, and this one really scared me. It scares me more than the Lechuza, actually. Uh, this is uh, uh, in the Book of Revelations 9, 7 through 9, 11. Uh, if you read that passage, it describes the return of the locust, and really freaked me out. And I was, I, as you read the description, uh, the uh, author says, uh, when you see this beast return to the earth, you, you really have to be careful. Uh, and he describes the locust as uh, the head of a, of a man, the face of a man with the hair of a woman, and uh, its body is made of armor. And uh, it has the head of a horse. Uh, its stingers shoot flames upon the earth, and uh, it wears a crown on its head. And its wings sounds like the beat of wings of a thousand chariots flying into battle. So I thought of that image, and one night I just really freaked myself out, and uh, I I just found a photograph of an Apache helicopter, uh, and they were all over the news, of course. And if you see the decal on the side of the Apache helicopter, it's the head of a horse, and the face of man and the hair of women are in the cockpit. Men and women fly these machines. The body is made of uh, metal or armor and iron, and its stinger missiles shoot flames upon the earth. Uh, it wears a crown on its head, and uh, its wings sound like uh, the beat of a thousand chariots flying into battle. So I think, uh, um, you know, I don't have to, you know, paint lechuzas and uh, chupacabras anymore because I think uh, these images are scary enough uh, just turning on the television. Uh, the, the colors, again, are day glow colors. I've used, uh, all these paintings have, well, the, that last painting uh, uh, has neon oranges and reds uh, in, in, mixed in with a lot of the acrylic. So they're, it's acrylic uh, uh, neon or day glow colors. And then finally, in this most recent work, you've returned to the image of the eye. This is the eye. The, I can't keep coming back. I, I can't get this image out of my head sometimes. And uh, I just have to translate this onto canvas. And uh, this piece is brand new, uh, just last year. And uh, um, um, it's entitled Ojo de Dios, uh, which, is, which means uh, the eye of God. You know, And I, I always. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm amazed of, at how people, you know, describe God and, and how they, they depict God. So uh, in this case, you know, uh, um, um, I, I um, you know, this, this recurring dream, I guess, or vision uh, keeps coming into my mind. And so you paint it. Yes, for definitely. For to share it. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so Rubio. much. If, if the artists could please take their seats. We're going to have a brief uh, conversation here. We're running a little over, but I hope you'll stay with us and we'll.